Thank you. What, what great praise. And we're going to plunge right into the Word of God today. It feels good to be popular, doesn't it? I mean, let's be honest. If, and some, some may not know what that feels like. Uh, I, I was not popular in school. Uh, not in, in my school. I was somewhat popular in a way in, in our youth group, but not at school. As I said last week, this event, Jesus feeding this multitude of people, this is really the peak of, of popularity in John's gospel. This is an incredible event, and you're going to see just how popular he was today. You know, popularity, though, can be dangerous. Steve Morrow in 1993 had just led his soccer team in England to a world title. The team grabbed him, threw him up on their shoulders, tossed him into the air, and forgot to catch him. And he left the field on a stretcher with a broken arm and oxygen on his face. Popularity can be dangerous. But we're in this series about Jesus, the journey and joy of knowing him, and we've just simply called it life. And last week we looked at this little fella, uh, we don't know his age, but he had two fish and five loaves and Jesus did this, this major miracle and fed this multitude. And take up with me reading again in verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Read just a little further. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there, except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone, However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Let's pray one more time. Lord, would you help us to focus today? L Lord, give us spiritual ears to hear. Lord, may we receive spiritual truth today. Lord, the greatest tragedy would be for someone to leave here the same as the way they came in. And I pray against that, Lord. I pray that I'd be changed. I pray that many would be changed. And Lord, I pray that we would, in the most noble sense of the phrase, that we would seek Jesus this morning. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The title of the message is simply, Seeking the Jesus of the Bible. That's the key part of the Bible. <laughs> Seeking the Jesus of the Bible. Who said this? As a child, I was taught from both the Bible and the Talmud. But now as an adult, I continue to be enthralled with that luminous Nazarene, speaking of Jesus. I continue to be as an adult enthralled by that luminous figure of the Nazarene. Albert Einstein said that, a Jewish man, not a believer, but enthralled with Jesus. These people are enthralled with Jesus. Remember, Jesus was withdrawing and he lifted up his eyes at the beginning of chapter 6. He had withdrawn after doing sort of a correction on some Pharisees in chapter 5 and having done a couple of miracles there pretty close together, um, healing the man in the pool and he, healing the nobleman's son. And he's withdrawing, but he lifts up his eyes and here they come, a multitude. 
and there was no McDonald's. They were hungry. He fed them. Well, he's withdrawing again. But they're hop, we read that extra few verses. They hopped in boats. They said, let's go find him. We don't know where he went. Let's go find him. And they, they were seeking Jesus. And we see Jesus doing some things that are miraculous. By the way, John doesn't mention Peter. But this is where Peter walked on the water as well. And I want us to just look into this passage and see Jesus' purpose Jesus' power and Jesus' and most of all this one, okay? And Jesus' person. That's going to be the key. But first, Jesus' purpose. Notice Jesus' purpose. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force, by the way, take him, that's an interesting word there. I think you'll appreciate this. That's the same word that's translated to snatch away or to rapture. They were going to snatch Jesus. They were going to grab him. They were going to not rapture him up in the air, but they were going to grab him. And you can kind of picture that soccer team I mentioned hoisting someone up onto their shoulders at the end of a victory. I mean, think about it from their perspective. If we get this guy to be our king, all our problems are over. We can be anywhere, anytime. We don't have to pack any food. Well, we might have to pack a small lunch. But other than that, we won't have to take any K rations or any kind of food, uh, C rations or, or um, MREs. Anyone ever eaten those? Meals ready to eat. We won't have to do we, we, We've got Jesus, and he'll just boom. And by the way, we've seen what he can do. If one of us gets wounded in battle, he'll just heal us. There is nothing that can stop us now. He's going to be our, come on guys, let's get him. Finally, we're going to liberate ourselves from the oppression of the Romans. And I guess they were wanting him, I guess, to start off just being king of Galilee because that's where he was. But they had higher ambitions. But this was not Jesus' purpose. You've got to get the order correct. And that's the first part of noticing Jesus' purpose. The order has to be prophet, priest, then king. First prophet, and why do I mention prophet? Look back at verse 14. Back up, we read this last week. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Of course, that's a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 18 where Moses says, there's going to come a prophet like me from your brethren. Listen to him. Well, they did not listen to Jesus, as we're going to see. But I wonder why it says, like Moses. I mean, you've got to admit Jesus is greater than Moses, but let's just hold that thought for a moment and say, let's look, there are other great prophets. Why Moses? I mean, Elijah was a great prophet. He didn't even have to die. He, he, didn't, he just went up. I mean, and you think about it, Samuel was a great prophet. He anointed Saul king and David king. I mean, he, and Solomon, incredible but Moses, unlike any other prophet, saw God face to face, or at least he saw more of God than anyone else. God came and covered Moses in the cleft of the rock and allowed him to see himself. And Jesus is purporting, he is explaining, he is making the claim throughout these discourses, these messages and teaching sessions. And we're going to see he's in the synagogue this, for much of this chapter 6. This is a long teaching session in the synagogue at Capernaum. And he's making the claim that he and the Father are pretty close. No, not pretty close. Real close, not just real close. They are one. Everything they do is in concert. He only does what he sees the Father doing. And he and the Father are one. And if you accept him, well, that means you've accepted the Father. If you, if you reject him, that means you've never really accepted the Father. And Jesus is coming for the Father's purpose. Not the per Listen, this is very applicable to today. Don't think this is some kind of high, heady, abstract, theological mumbo-jumbo. There are a lot of people who have 
sort of taken Jesus. Now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, amen? But, but they've taken the thought of Jesus, the idea of Jesus, some of the words of Jesus, some of their perceptions of Jesus, and they've tried to take him by force and rein him in, rope him in to their cause. That's why we have the sage like Jesus, the designer Jesus. We have the revolutionary Jesus that's got to overturn all of Western society because after all, uh, we need to know that Western society was strictly built on and for white privilege. That's what we're being told. Now listen, this is not, what a tragedy to ra- you know what race baiting is? When you try to get people of different races opposed to one another. That's, that's a tragedy. You know, there's only one race. Did you know that? The Bible teaches there are many ethnicities. There are many tongues or languages. But there's one race. It's the human race for which Jesus died. Amen? But the problem with these people that want to snatch Jesus and make him their king for their cause then and now is they don't really receive everything Jesus is saying, and they, the, now they can sort of craft their own Jesus. Then they couldn't do that. They just had to reject him. And we're going to read a verse today that clearly identifies their rejection of Jesus. But today, in fact, a bunch of scholars got together about the time I was graduating high school, and they called themselves the Jesus Seminar. And they said all th- sorts of things. The one thing they really all agreed was not true was that Jesus died in our place in atonement for our sin and that he literally rose from the grave. Of course, when you kind of start with that as your main foundation, you're going to go wrong from the, there on out, right? That's not a very good starting place. But did you know they voted on all of these things that we're reading? They voted on especially what is attributed to coming out of the lips of our Lord. And they voted on this one and they color coded it. And one was Jesus definitely said it. And one was, well, Jesus said something kind of like this, or the apostles said this, but they gleaned it from Jesus. And then the, I forgot the color code system. It's really not affected my life that I don't remember it. Uh, But, but the last color was that, oh, well, Jesus never said this as apostle. This was just something added later. Well, that's why this order's correct, got to be correct. If Jesus is not the prophet who was to come into the world, we shouldn't listen to him. He is, though, the Bible says, prophet, priest, and king. And what does a prophet do? He is a spokesperson for God. But more than that, Jesus is more than that. He's like Moses. He's seen God face to face. Even the woman at the well, when Jesus says, if you'll come to me, I'll give you not manna, not food, not bread, but water. He uses water as the metaphor, living water. You will never thirst again. And then I want to show you something. I came across this reading and I thought this is incredible, but you don't have to turn there, but just listen to Acts chapter 3 verses 19 and following. And you can turn there if you're one of these fast Bible drillers or you you remember that. Repent. This is Peter preaching. Y'all remember Peter, right? Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So already, hey, the Lord can meet your need. Kind of like the woman at the well, kind of like these 5,000 men and then women and children who were fed and refreshed. And that he may send Jesus, verse 20, Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. I'm going to skip down to the last verse, verse 26. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Peter says, hey, uh, brothers, Jewish brothers, chosen of God, 
God sent him to us first. We're, we're the nation from whom God has called all the prophets, and this special prophet, he was the servant Jesus. And later he says, whom you crucified, it's got to be a prophet. Jesus, we have to hear the words of Jesus. No wonder in the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, when Jesus appeared in his glorified state with Moses and Elijah on either side, and Peter, James, and John, remember, they're the only ones that witnessed it. No wonder the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, hear him. The application for these people here that want to alter Jesus' purpose. And the application for you is that we must hear the words of Jesus. Don't make Jesus into something that you want him to be. You listen to his words. You understand the meaning of his words. Jesus is telling them that they need to be right with God. What did Jesus do? He came preaching, the Bible says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. He told Nicodemus, that Pharisee, that trained one in the law, truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He told them they need to be right with God, but he's not just leaving it there. He's telling them how to be right with God. Skip down to verses 27 and 28. We'll eventually get here, but just, just check this out. This is in reference to they, they're wanting another meal. That last one was pretty good, and besides that, it was free. Amen? How many of you love a free meal? You're Baptist, you do. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Now, that's, that phrase, works of God, means the works that God has prescribed, that we can earn our salvation. That's exactly what that means. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That's the work of God. You want, you, you, know, you want to know what to do to be saved? Believe, put your trust in me, Jesus said. It's so important. You see, they want to make him a political king, but there had to be a cross before a coronation. There had to be a crown of thorns before a crown of jewels. I want to tell you, we don't crown him as Lord. We do in a sense of our own lives, but he is Lord. We're merely acknowledging that he is Lord. He was a special prophet, the one of whom Moses spoke, the one that was to come into the world, raised up from his brothers, that was like Moses. But bless his holy name, there is one greater than Moses that's here, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And Moses was the house that God used, his economy, his baptism through the Red Sea and leadership. But Jesus is the creator himself. The writer of Hebrews says he, he knows what we're going through. He's our high priest. That's the next thing that... that that he is. He's a prophet, then he's priest, and then he's king. And what does, what does a priest do? A priest helps us to relate to God. A priest represents us to the Lord. A priest is to be faithful to mend the fence that is separating us from the Lord. Moses indeed was a faithful in all his house as a servant, Hebrews 3.3, 3, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. A greater than Moses is here, the author of Hebrews says. And Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, He's the priest. He's telling them, you need to come to me. You need to come to hear my words, and then you need to come to me. I'm the advocate with the Father, and then king, but the right kind of king. And this leads us to the next part of Jesus' purpose. You see, you've got to get the order right. He's come. He came preaching. He came to bridge the gap between God and man by being our substitute, by going between us and the Lord to make things right. And then he will rule in our hearts and then rule literally forever the world as the king. 
And I want to talk about the office of king. Let's get the office correct. If we're going to get his purpose correct, we've got to get the order correct and the office correct. And what do you mean, pastor? King. Well, king of what? I mean, there's Burger King. I mean, there, there are monarchies still in our world. Did you know that? I mean, I looked this up. Estuatini. I don't know if I said that. I mean, there's a king there. You know, kings have more authority than presidents. You know that if you've studied. How many of you paid attention in uh, U.S. government when you were in about the ninth or 10th grade? Did you pay attention? You, you know this. You know that we live in a democratic republic. And yet, do you really think that this king with absolute authority in one of these smaller countries, do they actually have more power than the American president? <laughs> No, you see, it really ma matters over which you are king. What, what, what are you king of, really? Well, we know he's king of kings and king of lords. He will be the king of Israel, but only because he is the king of kings and lord of lords. In the early, many years ago, in the medieval times, the pope would crown the king. Most of you have probably heard the story of Napoleon Bonaparte, or Bonaparte that, you know, I don't know if it's legend or if it's fact. My son could probably tell us. He grabbed the, king, the crown and from the Pope's hands and crowned himself king because he didn't want anyone to have authority over him. But who's going to crown Jesus? The thrice holy God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, no less, will officiate at his coronation. Not this mob. This mob of people will not crown the Lord. This mob of people we have today, they will not crown him Lord of all. He is Lord over the rich, over the poor. He is Lord over the lost and over the saved. It's just a question of who recognizes his lordship. Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the king, first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, he, he's, why does he get crowned Lord? He came back from the dead. You, he's going to be crowned Lord. And I saw, Revelation 6, 2, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Why will he be crowned? God has crowned him, and he is the conquering king. And then John 6, 38. By the way, before we look up here, look up here. Do you, do you remember the temptations of Christ? The devil came to him, remember? And you know, if you'll, why don't you turn these stones to bread? Why don't you uh, jump off and the angels will gird up and not let your feet touch the rocks? But the other one was the temptation of power. Jesus, why don't you bow down to me? And you see all these kingdoms, they can be yours. Now, this time, it's not the devil tempting him. I use the word tempt very generally, test. It's not the devil. Sometimes it's the world. And here it's the world. Look at verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Isn't that sort of like Jesus re responding to the devil as it is written? Uh, you, you cannot, you don't worship anyone else, but the Lord thy God. They've come to take him by force and to make him king. And he says, no, I've not come to do what I want to do. I've come for the right purpose, to do the will of my Father. Here it is, offered by the world instead of the devil. And we all know their thought process or think we know where all our problems will be over. But I don't only want you to notice Jesus' purpose. I want you to notice Jesus' power. Then he withdrew again. And evening came, verse 16. His disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over to the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark and Jesus had not come to them. Probably Jesus said, look, I'm going to meet you over there somewhere. Just look for me. You'll see me. You, you'll, you'll see me. I'll, I'll come find you. But he wasn't here. And it was dark. And people didn't travel in the dark back then. It was dangerous. Verse 18, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And they were afraid. By the way, I just want to ask you, what would be more impressive? 
Jesus up on the shoulders of that multitude of people, being crowned and ushered into an earthly kingdom, if you saw that, I mean, surely that would be impressive, right? It would be impressive, no doubt, but, but would that be as impressive as you look out there and it's as if Jesus is saying, I'm not some little king. I'm not a little king. I'm a great big king. In fact, I'm king over the universe. All the elements have to obey me. Obey me. The wind and the waves are at my beck and call. The power of Jesus calming the storm. The Bible says, he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. We'll come back to that in a moment. And they willingly received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. The calming of the storm. King of creation. The commandeering of the ship. It's as if as soon as Jesus and Peter boarded, they were back to the shore. John leaves some of this out but for his purposes. But why did Jesus do this? We know he's developing their faith and the faith of others. I think he's saying to them, guys, I needed to get you away from mass popular opinion and show you that I don't need them. My power, my authority, my greatness has nothing to do with them and what they want to do. My power is over all. My plans and purpose have to do with you men and what my Father wills to do. And in the turbulence of what is about to happen, I will come to you. And think of how turbulent it would be. Think of the night in Gethsemane in the garden. Think of the arrest. Think of the beating Jesus took, the, the mockery of trials he went through, and then being nailed to the cross and put in that tomb but he came to them. He came first up from the grave and then he appeared in their midst and said, peace be unto you. I will come to you. But until then, you need to know life's all about me. Let me just say to this, you, this to you this morning. I don't know if you're going to die and go to heaven if you're a believer, if Jesus is going to snatch you away in the rapture. But I know this. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, Jesus knows life's all about him and he will come to you. He will come to you. Now, this leads me to the last part and the best part. Notice Jesus' purpose. Prophet, priest, then king. And a real king. The correct office, not just a little king. Notice Jesus' power. He's over it all. And now notice Jesus' person. Look back at verse 20. But he said to them, it is I. Most of you don't speak that way. It's correct in the English with the linking verb. When it's a statement of um, not action, but of personal quality, you can say it this way. This is the right way to say it. In Greek, and I know we have one really, really good student of Greek uh, here that probably knows Greek is better than I do here today, visiting with us, and she'll recognize this, ego a me, or ego I me, however you want to say it, I am. Did you know most of the time when, you, when it's ego I me, you see I am, but in this place, that's exactly what is translated, it is I. And remember, back to Moses, in the burning bush, Yahweh said, you can say, I am has sent you. Yes, this is Jesus saying, don't be afraid, I am. It's all about me and what is he going to say? Well, let's just, let's just take up, let's just look at these next verses to help us finish up. I read verses 22 through 24. They came seeking Jesus. Verse 25, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? I mean, they're thinking, this is, how did you get here? This is another miracle. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. In other words, you're not even just a miracle monger. 
You're not even just coming because of the signs. You, you want some more food. Verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Okay, we'll believe Jesus, but do another miracle. Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're still hungry. They're still wanting a free meal, aren't they? It's kind of funny. Verse 32, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. What a metaphor. God sustains you, not Moses, by giving you that bread, but God has given you the bread of life. He's sending me. I'm the manna from heaven. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Sounds like the woman at the well, doesn't it? Lord, show me where I may, I don't have a, a, anything good to draw with, but sh show me where this water is. And Jesus said to them, I am, ego a me, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He threw the, the water metaphor in there again, didn't he? But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. They were seeking Jesus. But church, listen to me. They weren't seeking the Jesus of the Bible. They weren't seeking who Jesus really was. And Jesus equivocally tells them, you have rejected me. You know never you will not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. I'm going to finish reading through verse 40 in just a minute, but let me just show you this scene. Isn't it interesting? He's teaching it's a good method of teaching. He's allowing them to ask questions. He's answering their questions. And we have really the first of the I am statements. And I am the bread of life, but really the first one is on the water where he says, it is I or I am. He's going to continue with this. All that Jesus is saying to them is pointing them to who he is. Notice Jesus' person. Verse 40 and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Then the Jews complained about him. They complained. They were asking questions in verse 25. They were questioning, questioning him. Then in verse 40, Jesus is answering. And then verse 41, they are complaining. Verse 52 they will walk away from Jesus. We won't read that until next week. Like the water with the Samaritan woman, they needed to understand more than the physical. The Lord isn't just so you can have a better life here or a best life now or even a blessed life. All these things can be byproducts, but he is your life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John chapter 16, verse 4. These are the works of God. The works, this is the work of God, not to a group of, of works that you do to get to heaven, but trust Jesus. Accept Jesus. And, and you, you don't get, we'll talk about the metaphor late, late, later. Jesus is not, he's going to say, eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's saying in the most definitive terms, you've got to realize I am your life. And that's why we've called this series Life, the Journey and Joy of Knowing Jesus. You've got to consume me, not literally, physically, but you've got to totally give yourself to me and consume me. His answers to their question pointed out three realities, and I'm going to close in just a second. Here they are. Jesus is the bread of life. They will never hunger again. Total satisfaction 
You know, I think eternal security can be found in these passages. You will never thirst again. You will never hunger again. Once you consume this food, you have eternal life. They are choosing to reject him, verse 36. You do not believe. You can choose to reject him today. And then finally, those in the true kingdom will come to Jesus. Anyone can come. Some people use this to teach uh, supralapsarian election Calvinism. Don't worry, you don't need to know what that even means. But God doesn't arbitrarily pick some for heaven and some for hell, but he knows all things. And I believe what he's saying here is that there's no way that Jesus will lose anyone who comes to him. These that come to him are a gift from his father. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, verse 40, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. Whosoever will may come. Do you want Jesus? You can take Jesus. What's Jesus' purpose really have to do with you? He wants to save you. He's seeking the Father, seeking worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. The Son of Man, Luke 19, 10, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He wants to be your bread of life. What does Jesus' power really have to do with you? There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. Just like Jesus walked on the water and defied gravity, there's a spiritual gravity waiting every single person here by nature, and it's going to wait you and sink you into hell. Except for the power of Jesus Christ in your life. And that's why in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, You who were dead in sins and trespasses, he's raised to life. That's why we're saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why it's his good pleasure to work and to will in our lives, Philippians chapter 3. And he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. What does Jesus' person really have to do with you? Well, I remind you of that message we did a few weeks ago in John 19 where they said these words and it's almost like you've got to pick your jaw up off the floor when they said to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. They rejected Jesus. Would you receive the Jesus of the Bible? He absolutely demands repentance and faith and total trust. He's not a good way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. Will you receive the Jesus of the Bible? And then believers, don't be duped by the world. Don't let the counterfeit Christs make you think you've missed something great. According to some, if we don't have certain analytical tools to supplement the gospel of Jesus, which is not enough, they say, then we'll never right all the wrongs of society. I ask you, did it appear that Jesus was trying to right all the wrongs of society there in this passage? He kept withdrawing. He kept withdrawing. He had a higher purpose. purpose. And, and, and that's not to say we don't speak up against injustice. That's not to, not to say we don't go vote our conscience and do what God's called us to do as faithful citizens. No, but, but it is to say this. Our enterprise is not some sort of theory where we can dismantle society. Society is trudging its way to hell, but we have the one who calms the wind and waves and commandeers the ship. And if we'll trust him, he'll make all things new. I want to tell you, Jesus Christ changes lives. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Would you right now trust Christ? If you, listen, 
maybe you're here today and you, there's not, you know, you've prayed a prayer. You've even been in the baptistry and you got, you got totally wet from head to toe, but there's never been a change in your life. Right now, would you just say, Jesus, I want you to really be my king and my Lord. I want to give my life to you. Would you not be like Albert Einstein and say, well, I'm enthralled by this luminous figure, the Nazarene. But could you say, he is my life. I've been saved by Jesus. Would you just cry out to him right now? Others, you, maybe you need to rededicate your life or come for scriptural baptism. We're, I'm going to pray in just a moment and we'll stand and sing. But, but don't reject Jesus. And by the way, if you come, you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt he'll never reject you. Let's stand as I pray. Lord, thank you that your promise is totally true and emphasize for us that you will in no way never cast anyone away that comes to you. Lord Jesus, you looked at that multitude and you fed every belly and there were even leftovers. Lord, you're enough. May we seek you, the Jesus of the Bible always. And Lord, move in this invitation. For it's in Christ's name we pray.